I know that we lackadaisically call him the weatherman with uh, at Ohio State, but in actuality, he's a weather climatologist. He does a wonderful job. Uh, farmers appreciate him. County extension agents appreciate him. Field specialists appreciate him. One of the things he's done is, is he's able to put it in ways that we can understand. So rather than stand up here and say, well, it's global warming this and global warming is that, when Aaron says you guys on average have five less fall work days in the fall, we, we perk up and we pay attention because we're like, well, that, that's important. I need to know that for my manure work that I do. And he so there's a lot of neat things that he's able to relate to, uh, to the audiences that I think is really appreciative. So Aaron, I'm going to have you come up, take over this morning and um, best of luck. Just don't pick on me because I am on a, up here after you again. All right. Thank you, Glenn, and good morning, everybody. I wish I could have brought a little more sunshine this morning. Oh, thanks, thanks. Yeah, I wish I could have brought uh, a little more sunshine, but you notice I wasn't up here when it was snowing a couple days ago, so I know my limits. Um, yeah, so uh, the purpose of my talk and, and, and what I like to do is just engage the agricultural community, primarily in Ohio, but also across most of the north central region on the physical basis of climate change. But more importantly, you know, this I, I talk about the, the, the weather and the climate side. It's, it's making those connections with the expertise in the room to think about solutions to what we're facing, these challenges that we're facing. And so what I'd like to do today is kind of set up the physical basis, talk about a few of those linkages, but then really set up for Frank and Laura as well uh, to continue the dialogue in, in some other areas. So I've, uh, you know, I see a lot of Ohio faces, which is good, but I, I was happy to know that there were going to be a lot of folks from outside of Ohio. So that's great. I can do a little bit different today, uh, but it still all comes back to weather, which is a, a uniting factor for all of us, right? It pulls us all together. So when we look at a picture like uh, what you see on the screen here, which is all Glaze County, a little bit south of here, you know, it's probably getting into the first or middle part of July here. The corn starting to get tall. It's probably late morning. We know that because uh, we can, you know, almost look at the picture. We can feel the humidity in the air. The, the clouds are starting to pop. We experience weather through our senses, right? All of the time, continuously. Uh, and, and farmers are natural meteorologists. You're all collecting, you know, farmers are collecting data. Uh, but as meteorologists, we collect a ton of data. We make these maps. We do forecasts. Uh, we're 50% right 50% wrong sometimes, you know, um, uh, but ultimately we're collecting a lot of data and that data needs to be interpreted and used. Uh, and then I think given back, given back to stakeholders that can use that data from water uh, usage and droughts and floods and all of these things uh, that impact us each and every day. Now, when we think about weather, you know, we sort of take it for granted. We get up, it's sunny out, temperatures rise 25 degrees pretty quickly. They drop 25 degrees in the evening, and we have these big oscillations every day up and down with the weather. Over time, these fast-paced changes, uh, you know, set up what we call weather patterns. And what you're looking at here is a, a simulation from August of 2017. You can see wildfire smoke and white, sea salt and blue, dust coming off Africa and, and beige. Uh, and you can see all of these particles in the atmosphere are being moved by our weather patterns. And those weather patterns establish the conditions that we expect over time, right? It's also kind of neat because we can see, hey, we get a lot of wildfire smoke during the summertime. If you remember last summer, we had a lot of wildfire smoke here during the month of July. Uh, you can see our tropical systems that are now carrying 30, 40, 65 inches of rainfall in just a few days in a lot of our tropical regions, right? So anyway, all of these weather patterns establish what we expect. Um, and if, again, if you're in the Ohio crowd, you've probably seen this 30 times now, but I love using this video, right? We're zoomed in, we zoom out, and now we have a dog. Okay, we're walking our dog. Now this dog is, you know, walking along with the dog owner, but sniffs a fire hydrant, right? Oh, my daughter likes to talk about dropping some pea mail up there. Uh, maybe a McDonald's wrapper. I don't know, maybe a good looking dog down here. The dog's gonna be moving in the opposite direction of the dog walker, right? But we still expect them to be in the same location in a couple minutes uh, based on the path that we see the dog walker taken. So without some big perturbation, like a big truck coming on the sidewalk, you know, which can happen. Right? We can see that they pretty much march along together, even though you very chaotic in that dog behavior. So we can think of the dog as the weather, the dog walker as the climate, right? So even though we can have a record warm day in a cooler season or a record low cold day in a very warm winter, for instance, 
that's how they relate. You know, you can relate those together. I just, I love using this illustration because I think it really ties the two uh, nicely together. Now let's zoom out. And again, I'm going to focus more. Most of the time I, I'm focusing a lot of Ohio, but now I can focus more uh, on, on the, the whole country here. Uh, but we're zooming out even farther and we're looking at the global assessment of change. Now we've been measuring directly our temperatures for a long time, since about the mid to late 1800s. Uh, and throughout that time, we can see how it's compared to the 20th century average, that 100 year average. 2021 last year is now the sixth warmest year on record since 1880. The top 10 warmest have all occurred since 2005, and the last seven years are the seven warmest years since 1880, right? So Glenn lied a little bit. I will talk about how our weather, our temperatures are getting warmer on a global level, right? Right, but it's the impacts, right, that really matter. It's not just the numbers. But how many of you were born after February of 1985? Raise your hand. You've never experienced a cooler than average month for the planet. Your entire lifetime has been warmer than average, okay? So this is what we're talking about when we talk about warming temperatures. Now, not every year, not every region is warmer or cooler than average. It changes, and that's what this map's showing here. You know, the 1930s in the United States was a very warm decade. The 50s through the 70s in the United States, especially the eastern United States, were particularly cold, right? But overall, we've seen a much more warming across the globe, especially at the high latitudes, the Arctic, Antarctic, uh, in, in our land masses, right? Now, it's a lot more than temperature, but we have to ask what happens to the atmosphere. So we have these awesome greenhouse gases, water vapor and carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, but mostly water vapor and carbon dioxide. They absorb all the energy coming off Earth's surface. It's how our atmosphere warms. Our atmosphere doesn't warm because the sun is warming it. The, they don't care about the sunlight. It's, the part, it's all the heat coming off Earth's surface. Uh, but importantly, and especially for agriculture in the Midwest and the Eastern United States, and actually even in the Western United States too, it affects that water cycle, okay? Increased water vapor, right, in the atmosphere because of strengthening evaporation from the surface that warms the atmosphere. A warmer atmosphere means what? More evaporation, right? So we're mostly an ocean, right? A evaporating a lot of water into the atmosphere and that water in the atmosphere then can get wrung out by some of these systems. Now in areas that are very dry, like the, like the, the West, right? They're on the opposite side of this where uh, you know, that, that heat and intense heat and, and, and weather patterns are established so that they get these multi-year droughts, right? These mega droughts. We, and, and I'll show you uh, what that looks like here in a second. So water vapor, CO2 are the big ones, but methane, right, is a very powerful greenhouse gas. And I think Frank's gonna talk a little bit more about that as well, uh, but also nitrous oxide. But we do pay attention a lot to carbon dioxide, or at least it's been a big uh, component of this for, for the last 40 years. Because right now, this past, well, we're coming up on our peak for this year next month, but last year we hit 420, 419 parts per million. And in our ice cores, which is something our, our lab does at Ohio State, the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center, uh, we study air trapped in the, in the ice. And we can look at the CO2 concentration throughout uh, the last 800,000 years of Earth's history, right? So we were under a lot of ice here about 18, 20,000 years ago when carbon dioxide was 180 parts per million. Our warmest periods are around 280 parts per million, but it takes us thousands of years to change between 180 and 280. We've gone from 310 when we directly measured it in 1958 to 419. So that's 60 years, the same that our natural cycles take thousands of years. And that's why we're concerned because it stays in the atmosphere for a long time. About 20% of it's there still in a thousand years from now, right? Unlike methane, which we can take advantage of because it's shorter, right? Shorter, it's more powerful, but a shorter, reson a shorter resonance time. So if we keep methane in check, then we're making a big impact on climate change mitigation. And that's what we're looking at here. So the estimated U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by economic sector. Again, this is for the U.S., mostly transportation and industry, uh, also commercial and residential, and about 10 percent, 9 to 10 percent in agriculture, right? Much of that is CO2. So these are the CO2 emissions for the U.S., about 80 percent, about 10 percent methane, right? But what, what can we do to take advantage of these as well? And if you look at methane emissions, right, a lot of it's coming from petroleum systems and natural gas, but also enteric fermentation and manure management. And that's why everyone in this room has a role to play, 
right? And, and, and through better manure management, which you are doing, right, you are helping to keep in check and, and to start mitigating some of these greenhouse gases. And of course, when we think about better feed and, and, and better forage quality, that can help on that side as well. So let's do a little experiment. The National Weather Service has updated their operational normal period. So operationally, um, this year, we switched to 1991 to 2020. So we look at a 30-year window operationally and say, hey, on today, it's supposed to be 52, or no, what are we here? About 58, 59 degrees on average for this day, right? Uh, that's because of the last 30 years, that's the average temperature on this date, right? Uh, but we just switched from 1981 to 2010, to 1991 to 2020, right? So basically, if you're looking at this time series, and this is the contiguous US average temperature for all the years, again, that's the dog walking back and forth. We can talk about the trends in a second, but we're just taking the red, the, basically the average here in the red and subtracting off the average in black, and we're looking at it across the entire US, okay? So most of the U.S. has warmed operational average about half to one degree, except across the Northern Plains, which by chopping off what we've done is we've chopped off the 1980s, we've added the 2010s to the record. So we're looking at a more recent period, right? So this is what's happened over the last, say, 40 years here with warming across much of the country, some cooling, especially in winter and spring across our Northern Plains. I'm not doing the lights, by the way. I don't know if that's a poltergeist or, or what's going on. We can look at precip, and I think precip really stands out even, even in the back, probably even more so. We've got a dividing line, right? Where is that 100th meridian? That's a good question. But we get a lot more, you know, our, our rainfall has increased here across the eastern U.S. It, we've dried out across the western U.S., right? So this is a 1 in 1,200 year. We're about a 1,200 year drought here, the, well, the worst we've seen in the last 1,200 years across the western U.S. But we can see overall the, the steady pretty steady increase in precip uh, across, across the U.S. So most of the eastern U.S., central U.S. is getting wetter, getting drier out west, and that dryness is advancing. It's advancing toward the east. That 100th meridian is on the move. And so places like Nebraska, Kansas, up into the Montana and parts of the Dakotas are actually seeing a more drying regime, okay? Let's break that down seasonally because I, I like to talk about this in the Midwest from a seasonal perspective. This is what it looks like in winter. So here across much of the Midwest, we're getting wetter, wetter in winter, right? Um, some wetness across the, the Northern Great Plains and dryness as well. Look, it matters where you are, even within the states, right? Precip can change big differences over small, small areas here. This is what it looks like in April. Again, drying out in the desert Southwest getting wet throughout the Great Lakes, much of the eastern U.S., southeast, and, and across the northern plains. Summer looks a lot different. We start getting dryness, dry trends across Illinois and the eastern Corn Belt in the middle of July, and then up across the Pacific Northwest. And then if we look at the change since October, again, most of the northern tiers back to wet, drying out across the south, right? So in Ohio, I like to say, okay, farmers, right, my friends, uh, your perfect growing season is a wet spring, a dry summer, and a wet fall. No, not exactly, right? But that's the challenge that we're having here locally. And that's the other point I want to make is what's happening here in Northwest Ohio might not match what you're seeing in your back door if you're in Utah or Idaho, right? Things look different depending on where you are. But warmer temperatures, more water vapor in the atmosphere, changes in our weather patterns are driving these changes. We know that, uh, uh, I'll skip over this pretty briefly, but we know also our, our precipitation is increasing in intensity, especially across the Midwest and the Eastern US, right? So uh, out, out West, again, it's a little bit different of a story, but our strongest events across the Midwest, Southeast United, uh, and Northeast are, are increasing anywhere from 25 to, to 55% in terms of those most intense, heaviest rainfall events. So we have to make some, uh, um, projections about what, what we're likely to face in the future. So we know we're getting warmer. We know we're getting wetter for the eastern half, drier in the, in, in the western half. So we use models, and all models are wrong. Some are useful, right? And so we use these that have a lot of different uncertainties, but we use a lot of models to come up with a consensus. And our best scientific knowledge right now is that by mid-century, across much of the northern United States, we're increasing about 3 to 5 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, a little bit less across the southern tier. And then as late century, we're getting up close to 48 degrees, four to eight degrees Fahrenheit warmer, okay? When we look at precip, again, we're, we're 
driven by increases in water vapor and changes in our weather patterns. This is the observed change again, a little drier west, wetter east. We see drier toward the southern states for winter, spring. Um, and then if you look at the northern tier of states, as the jet stream shifts farther north, wetter winters, wetter springs. But overall, large portion of the country, extending even into the east, all except the east coast here, with drier summers, right? So we're changing the seasonal distribution, we're changing the intensity of the rainfall, we're changing our temperatures, and those have a lot of impacts. So I like to throw this up for Ohio, and different states can have these. Uh, this is Ohio, for instance, and uh, moving from a, 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 you know, our, our climate in 2003, more like a mid-Atlantic winter, and then I asked my farmers in Ohio, how would you like an Arkansas summer? Because that's, that's where trends, that's where we're moving to here. In different states, we can, you can project that for different states. Uh, across the south, I usually get that answer is what's happening there. Well, the precip map showed you. Our deserts are expanding northward, right? Generally, they lie around 30 degrees north and south latitude, but they're expanding. And so drier weather overall with those shifts and those jet streams farther, farther north. So there are a lot of challenges. So we're at a point where we're saying, okay, we're going to weigh what our challenges and what our opportunities are. And we're trying to put more of those things in the opportunity bin, right? Because there's been a lot of talk about these challenges and, and all of the doom and gloom and things like that, which, yes, we're facing some serious challenges here in agriculture from the way things are changing. But what can we take advantage of? Uh, like low, longer growing seasons, new crops. How can warmer temperatures decrease our maintenance costs, our cooling and heating costs for livestock, for instance? Uh, what about carbon sequestration opportunities to increase organic matter? How much more stuff can we put on this side to help combat things like heat stress, right? On our livestock, on our farm workers. Uh, lower food productivity, reduce quality, reduce protein, increase weeds, insects, potential diseases, unpredictable growing seasons, right? All of this erratic nature, right? Also lends itself to what? Mental health issues. Right. And, 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 and just trying to deal with farming in today's climate becoming harder and harder. So I want to just kind of set up a few of these to think about. Um, and, you know, when we think about warming temperatures and heat stress, uh, you know, impacts on livestock certainly has, has the, the, the evidence shows us that, that we have slower weight gain uh, with the increased heat stress, reduced milk yield and quality uh, and feed conversion rates. Uh, but again, like I mentioned, maybe we have some reduced costs associated with warmer temperatures, but that may mean that we improve the housing or cooling or, or, or things like that. Uh, there's this uh, recent study that looked at future climate, uh, it should say climate projections. Um, the way we look at that, those models and that span, right, we're looking at anywhere from 14 to $40 billion in production losses by the end of the 21st century. Okay, Those, that's, that's a big number. <laughs> we think about our changes in productivity and the quality of the forage it, crops. It, it varies based on the crops, right? Some it, pr productivity may increase, right? But then we're, we're looking at things like the protein content and what's happening to the protein content as it decreases a bit in some of these crops. And so those questions are going to be at play as well. I mentioned uh, shift, shift, well, maybe I didn't, the shifting growing zones. Right overall, we've seen a shift to the north and west in our growing zones that you can see here in the upper right. Right, uh, we see these unpredictable growing seasons, what we call fall springs, where uh, in the Midwest we warm up into the. We didn't see it this March. Uh, we didn't see it this February. Actually, we had a couple warm days, but it's been persistently cold, which is good. It's kept things at bay, uh, but we've seen a lot more frequent warm Februarys and Marches, followed by what happens in April. We call them late freezes here in Ohio, but they're not late. Right, we're just now getting to our, our late, our, our normal freeze date here in Ohio. What about invasives and non-native plants? A lot of attention to things like corn earworm, overwintering in, in far northern, more northern locations as we move uh, throughout time here. And then of course, precipitation impacts. Um, the big thing about the Midwest, what's a little different from maybe the, the Western United States is we're seeing big oscillations between two extremes. Right, even within single seasons, where we can go from intense rainfall and flood to drought and back to flood again, right, becomes more of a management issue. But what happens when five and a half inches of rain falls in two hours on a bare field in June, in January or February, right? 
We're seeing heavier rainfalls earlier in the season. Obviously, that means more runoff, more potential contamination as well. Uh, Glenn let it out of the bag with the field work days. This is just for Ohio, but, but we can look across the entire uh, country and see similar, um, well, depending on where you are. Again, it's, it's going to matter. But here in Ohio, we've lost five days in April. That's what we're looking at as NAS reported suitable field work days since 1995 and five days in October to be able to do work, right? Funny enough, Glenn, uh, we're increasing our June work days. Where'd he go? Oh, he already left. Right, so we're increasing our June work days, right? So uh, maybe, maybe we can get a little more side dressing done, right, in June, early June. Wetness issues on livestock, right? So increase in winter rainfall. What's that do to our soils and our, our pastures and paddocks? Right, they get muddy here, right? And muddy, muddy conditions can hinder performance, lead to issues with feet, right? Compromise insulative properties of, of the coat. So there's a researcher, Kristen Nichols at Ohio State that's been looking at this. Weighing cows and beef heifers also housed in muddy conditions and, and finding loss of body weight in late gestation series, right? So looking at that Corn Belt, December through May precipitation across the Corn Belt region, we've seen that increase in, in the cooler season rainfall leading to these muddier conditions across much of the Midwest. Right. Impacts on soils, they vary, right? Increasing temperatures. So that helps drive some loss of organic matter, uh, increased mineralization rate, loss of soil structure. Uh, we often talk about CO2, right? In increasing productivity of some plants, that's true. Increasing soil organic matter, that's an opportunity, right? To, to with those carbon sequestration I was talking about. But increasing rainfall, increased soil moisture, wetness, nutrient leaching. Uh, so we have to weigh all of these things as a, as a decision maker at, at the field level and the farm level. These are the decisions that we're making. And, and so it, it obviously brings in the human component of all of this, right? And I think Laura is going to touch on this, but I like to think of, of adaptation. It's, it, there's no single answer, right? What you do on your farm is not going to be the same thing that everyone else in the room does because we're basing our decisions on much more than, hey, it's getting wetter or it's getting drier. Our values, our culture, our location, our goals, our objectives, what we're doing, our practices. And we've got to maintain profitability, right? So we have to balance these things uh, all together. So your decisions are, are going to mean something, right, for you. They have to mean something for you. And when we think about mitigation, and I don't go too far into this, but this is where I think, you know, livestock management, we have an opportunity really to, to help lead the world. And in a lot of respects, we are. 14.5% uh, of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions come from somewhere in the livestock supply chain, right? Um, these are the sources of emissions here in the middle with the livestock supply. Again, enteric fermentation, right? This is a, a place that we can improve and get better. Uh, and you can already see with the efficient practices with livestock management, right? We can really drive down greenhouse gases across the world, right? And we can lead in this arena, and I think we are. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. Some other things that are being practiced, and of course, it, always, it also comes down to economics and what you can afford. And again, I'm not an expert in these things, but I think a lot of folks are already focused on improved feed and, and food you know, productions. How do you manage the manure management, right? Uh, what's happening? Can we, can we also do some more tech and innovative stuff, biogas capture and use systems, uh, a lot of the times we're, we're converting that methane to CO2 because it's less powerful um, in, in, our, in our atmosphere. But what are some of the other ways that we can help mitigate some of these emissions as well? So uh, with that, I think my time is coming to a close for my portion. We will take all of our questions at the end of all three presentations today, but I certainly want to take an opportunity to thank you and to be here. And of course, look forward to your questions. My email's there too, wilson.1010 at osu.edu. I love talking weather and climate and how I can provide more information to help you do what you do. So thank you. Who's got questions? There's one. The temperature expectation in 2030 and on beyond. What kind of certainty do you have with those type of projections? Yeah, so um, those are an ensemble consensus right, of all of our models. Um, a few of them are on a cooler side of that. Some of them are on the warmer side of that. 
Um, so uh, I would I would say that yeah I mean we have pretty good confidence in what the models in terms of the warming continues. Uh, what what models don't tend to do very well are how extreme are the extremes? How extreme are the precip extremes? How extreme are the temperature extremes? So there's more uncertainty on the extremes. Uh, but when it comes to uh, you know confidence in the seasonal changes, winter, spring warming. Less so in the summer, where I think the greatest uncertainty for the Midwest and the East United States is what our summers are going to do, uh, because there's been some, you know, um, you know, climate impacts agriculture, but agriculture obviously impacts uh, the climate as well. And the Midwest and the East United States are two regions in the world that are not that haven't shown an increase in summer extremes. Um, it's attributed to increases in water vapor and agricultural intensification across the Midwest or agriculture activity across the Midwest and the East United States. And so, there, yeah, I mean, to, to say that there's not um, certain areas that we're, we're less certain about, we, we certainly are. But overall warming in that range of three to five is what get, we're, we're confident in that range. Yeah.